Uh, this recording is for the Dixon Public Library's uh, Oral History Project. My name is Paul Farrell and today, which is the 19th of August, 1998, I'm talking with uh, Bud Rossi right here in the, in the Dixon Library. Uh, well, Bud, let's start with some, uh, some family history, whatever you happen to know. Do you know any much about uh, well, grandparents and things? As related to uh, our coming to Dixon, my father was born in Italy in 1888. And at the age of 16, he came to the United States by himself. Uh, on the uh, recommendation of an uncle in Chicago. He landed in Chicago and immediately came to San Francisco where he lived with with uh, friends in San Francisco. Uh, his He came to Dixon in about 1908 after the San Francisco earthquake and fire. And he came to Dixon uh, answering a, uh, a newspaper ad that a uh, farmer had placed in the San Francisco paper looking for mechanics to work on his automobiles. Uh, that was about the time that automobiles were coming into uh, being used and uh, he could find no one to adequately take care of his automobiles here in Dixon. This was in the early 1900s. So he came to Dixon and worked for a farmer by the name of Mays, Roy Mays. And Mays was also a uh, racing car enthusiast and he recruited my father to drive his racing cars and we have pictures of those cars that were uh, raced in different uh, towns up and down the Pacific Coast. Uh, so that is how the Rossi family became part of Dixon, my father coming here in about 1908. Uh, he, uh, he became uh, interested, well he was a, in his, when he landed in San Francisco at that young age, he uh, became an apprentice in a machine shop as a machinist and uh, it was a gear works a company Pacific Gear Company and uh, he held that apprentice work and developed into a full-time machinist then this, as I say the earthquake uh, and fire devastated their their property there and so he did odd jobs around as a mechanic on uh, automobiles and that's when he in 1980 he uh, answered the ad to come to Dixon. When he was in Dixon, he worked w with Mays for several years. And uh, then the Carpenter family, who was an old time established family here that had a livery stable on, on First Street and blacksmith shop, uh, went into maintaining automobiles. So my father went to work for him and they formed a partnership with Milton Carpenter where they took on a, a car agency. Uh, that was in the livery stable that was part of Main Street. It was uh, a blacksmith shop and it eventually turned into a uh, repair shop for automobiles. It, it, had, it had quite a history because the local morgue was attached to the side of that building. Uh, about 1914, uh, 13 or 14, uh, my father became a partner with a man by the name of Clarence Freeze, whose uh, family farmed north of Dixon. And uh, they formed a partnership called Freeze and Rossi, and they built the downtown garage at the north end of uh, Main Street, right by the railroad crossing. And uh, they took on different uh, automobile companies as their agents. One of them was uh, 
overland, and another one was uh, the original Oldsmobiles. Uh, young Freeze and my father were partners till 1917 when uh, Young Freeze uh, was drafted into the Army prior to World War I. My father had married and had established a family, and he stayed on. And uh, during the war, Young Freeze was uh, killed in the war. And so that dissolved the partnership with my father. My father and his brother, who had come to Davis when was a uh, working in an auto agency in Davis, came to Dixon and they formed a partnership. It was Rossi Brothers, and that was formed in about uh, 1919, and it uh, it prospered all through the early 20s till about 19. 39, I graduated school at Davis and uh, came into the business and I bought my uncle out and it was my father and I that uh, continued with the business. Uh, in the meantime, they had uh, taken on uh, farm equipment as part of their uh, business and uh, they expanded the, the farm machinery where they acquired the uh, dealership for the Alice Chalmers farm equipment. That was in 1929. And uh, farm equipment dealers in Dixon prospered with the uh, development of new machinery. Uh, in the early part of the uh, century, horses were replaced soon by tractors. And farm tractors became uh, pretty much the method of uh, tilling the soil here in the Dixon area. Uh, also, they went from wheel, wheel tractors to crawler tractors, and crawler tractors were the, were the main source of power in, the, in tilling the soil because they needed uh, heavy horsepower to uh, till deep into the soil, which in, when we went into irrigation, you had to have you had to have a deep penetration of the, of the soils with uh, what they call subsoiling, and so that's where crawler tractors came in. The uh, the uh, advent of uh, self-propelled combines. The, the combines that were used in the farms were originally pull type with. Uh, many mule teams pulling the, the large harvesters, which were, uh, they used sacks, they, they uh, harvest the grain and put the grain into sacks all on the machine itself and dump the sacks in the field. Then they came into, in later years, they came into self-propelled grain harvesters where they went into what they call bulk, where they, instead of putting in sacks, they put them into big tanks and then uh, drain the tanks into trucks that haul them over to, to uh, elevators. Uh, that was a big change that took place in the uh, late 20s. Uh, one of the big changes that came about in, in the agriculture around the Dixon area was the uh, beginning of more irrigation. All the farmland around here was dry land farmed, and it was green, and in some areas, they leveled certain parts of their farm and sunk uh, wells, put in wells, and irrigated. But the irrigation uh, was an expensive uh, deal because they had to level the land in order to uh, to irrigate the crops. Well, little by little, in the late 20s and early 30s, more land came under irrigation with uh, deep wells uh, pumping water into uh, the fields. Uh, some of the crops that were grown were uh, sugar beets, and mostly alfalfa because there were a lot of dairy farms. And uh, in the late 20s, some outside investors came here 
and uh, grew lettuce. And they built two big lettuce sheds. One of the sheds still remains on North First Street. I think it's used as a warehouse and, a, and is an archery uh, uh, shop there now. Uh, the lettuce was grown for many years, I'd say six or seven years, until the the uh, soil was depleted and they couldn't uh, profitably grow the lettuce without a lot of expensive fertilizer. So the lettuce was uh, farming was abandoned. But during those years, they shipped a lot of lettuce from these uh, packing sheds. They uh, brought railroad cards in alongside of these sheds and uh, the local ice company, the Union Ice Company, uh, brought ice over to these uh, sheds and and chipped them into the uh, railroad cars uh, and uh, they had cool cars when they shipped them across the United States. But that was abandoned and the sheds are still here but uh, no more lettuce. But we've gone in with the irrigation now. We've, we're one of the largest uh, tomato-growing areas in the state. We have field corn. And the irrigation is was pretty well established in the uh, in the mid uh, 50s when the Monticello Dam was built, and uh, the irrigation was more prevalent with the irrigation district forming, and it relieved the underground pumping. In fact, it replaced uh, underground water uh, storage and that uh, the water tables came up higher after the surface irrigation was established. Well, it sounds like you have a lot of knowledge of, of farming for somebody who... Now, now, did you yourself, did you grow up on a ranch or a farm? No, or I, I, a, a I grew up in, in town in, in uh -huh. Dixon, uh, uh, spending some time in my father's business there, uh, sweeping it out every Saturday for 50 cents. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about what I remember about uh, downtown Dixon. Now how, what's the earliest things you remember as, as a small child? Well, I remember all the, uh, the gas pumps that were on Main Street. Uh, the highway came into into Dixon. Uh, it was Highway 40. It was the main U.S. cross-continental artery. Uh, you couldn't, in the early 20s, uh, if you traveled by automobile from San Francisco to Sacramento, in most a lot of times you'd have to buy gas uh, in between in, on your trip or you had repairs because uh, the cars were not made like they are today. There's So uh, the highway came into Dixon down uh, Porter Road and it came to the railroad crossing at uh, the south end of town. It went into town through A Street and it went up to Main Street where it turned to the left and went north and they crossed the railroad again at the north end of town. And within that area, there were 11 gas pumps that were in garages and in front of uh, different stores. There was one in front of uh, the Marvin garage, which was to the right where the, where the post office is now. And then there was on down in the next block where uh, the uh, Frosty is there now. There was uh, McGimsey's Ford garage, and across the street there was another garage. It was called the City Garage. And then you went on up to what is Main Street, and you turned left and went north. There was a uh, service station on the corner, which is a vacant lot there now. And you went on down the Main Street and on the right, in the middle of the block, where the Bank of America building is now, there was uh, Wagley's Garage, where there was a gas pump. And then you went uh, on down the next block, where the uh, Women's uh, Improvement Club Park is. There was a standard station on the corner of C Street and the park. 
and across the street there was a carpenter's tire shop with a gas pump there and then on north uh, there was Rossi Brothers with their garage and gas pump and you crossed the railroad tracks and on the right was D'Artney's garage with a gas pump. You went a little farther down to uh, the, the vacant yard of two gas stations there on the right. And so there were about 11 gas pumps or stations in the city of Dixon. Now that's uh, a real change. Uh, garages nowadays don't have gas pumps. No, that's right. But it sounds like every garage had their own well, pump back then. Well, that's right, because uh, uh, people that owned automobiles in Dixon, and the, that was a population then of about between 800 and 1,000. It was less than 1,000 in those early 20s. And if you had an automobile, you had to buy your gas uh, at the, anywhere you could find these pumps. And so uh, they all vied for, for uh, the business of filling up these gas tanks. And also it was in connection with a garage in most cases. Uh, there were also five or six automobile dealerships here. The uh, the one as you came into town on the on the from the west on the right there was Marvin's Garage. He had a Graham Page agency, and then he went a little farther down in the next block there was the McGimsey's Ford agency, and across the street in the city garage uh, there was a uh, sub-agency for a Vacaville dealership that handled Buicks. That was at the city garage. And then you came around uh, onto uh, Main Street or First Street. In the middle of the block, there was the Wagley garage, which was a Chevrolet agency. And then you went on down past the uh, city park. On the right was Rossi Brothers. That uh, over the period of time from the early 20s, they handled several different car lines. They handled Haynes, they handled Rickenbacker, which was a premium car in those days, and then they finally wound up as a General Motors agency, and they handled uh, Oakland Pontiac, and then uh, in the 30, early 30s, 30, 34, they became the Oldsmobile dealer. And uh, when the 1973 uh, when I was in the business, we gave up the automobile agency, and we were one of the oldest Oldsmobile dealerships in in the, in the whole uh, scheme of things, as far as uh, General Motors. Uh, then you went a little farther down across the railroad tracks. There was uh, D'Artney's garage that had the Star Agency for Star Automobiles. So there were about five or six automobile agencies in a town of about. 800, whereas today we're a town of 13,000 and we have one agency. So that tells you how things change. Uh, in selling automobiles today, you uh, line up seven or 800 cars in your front yard, or you get on television and you scream all the different uh, values that you're that you're offering, and. Uh, Automobiles are, are marketed a lot different than they did in my day when I <coughs> when I went into the business. <coughs> excuse me. We uh, we kept two or three cars in stock, but uh, we could order a car just the way you wanted it, with all the different accessories and the, and the uh, color, and we could get it in about three to four weeks at the most. So we did a lot of ordering and. Uh, had people get exactly what they wanted. But that's not the case today. The, the manufacturers build their cars and you take them and you stock them. And if you don't have the color that which a customer wants, you trade it with other dealers and that's the way it's done today. Well, uh, you talked about the number of uh, gas pumps and garages in, in Dixon because it was a a way of passing through going from San Francisco to Sacramento. So these were all services. Now, what about the services for uh, the people inside those cars? Uh, what, what, there must have been a few hotels here in Dixon? Uh, 
No, there there was one hotel which uh, was on the corner of uh, First and A Street. Uh, there was uh, one uh, motel that was uh, started, but it never never flourished. There, I, I would say that uh, in the early 20s there was no sleeping accommodations. We had uh, several restaurants. There were several restaurants on Main Street. Uh, so uh, the one of the, of course, we forget to mention that the railroad was an integral part of transportation in those days. We had uh, the, the main depot and we had about four train stops a day each way. So you could get on a train and go to Sacramento or you get on a train and go to the Bay Area. Four times a day in yeah, each direction. In each direction. Hmm. Passenger trains. Mm -hmm. Plus on top of that there were the freight trains. Uh, so uh, the railroad crossings were quite busy in those days and we had uh, uh, manual uh, crossing gates that came down. They were manned by 24, 24 hours a day by people in what they called the crossing towers where a, a man was perched up in these towers and as the train came by uh, they lowered the gates. And uh, one of the tragedies we had in Dixon was in the uh, mid-twenties, I think it was 25 or 26, at the uh, South Crossing, there was some confusion one day in the in the gate coming down in time, and a Greyhound bus was caught in the middle of the track, and it was demolished by a, a train, a through train. It wasn't a stopping train, and there were several casualties, uh, deaths, and many injuries. So, with that, the uh, state highway. Commission decided to do away with the t highway going through town where they had two railroad crossings and they moved the highway uh, on from coming down Porter and, and tying on to Adams Street and going out Adams and coming into Main Street at the north end of town. Uh, they had to move, there was a big home right in the middle of uh, of what is now uh, the Adams and A Street intersection. The Watson family had a big home there and they moved it from there so they could open up an extension of Adams Street to go south to Porter. They moved it up on A Street and uh, so the, the freeway or the highway came down Porter, entered Adams Street and went north to an intersection of uh, North Main Street. And then the gas stations propped up there. There were, uh, on the corner of Adams and A Street, there were three gas stations that were established. There was a, a new standard station that was built on the corner. There was a new uh, associated station, associated oil or tidewater, and there was a shell oil station that was established on, on that corner. Then down the street there were some more stations that were started. And then out on the end there was another uh, gas station which was uh, built where the Buckhorn uh, restaurant is there now. What about some of the other uh, businesses <coughs> downtown? Um, there must have been some good stores. Uh, there was a theater, well, wasn't there? Well, we had a movie theater uh -huh. uh, that uh, had nightly nightly shows and that was family entertainment. Uh, there were three restaurants downtown. There were two banks. There was uh, there were two uh, dry goods stores or clothing stores. One was a general clothing store and another was a men's haberdashery. There were uh, five, four or five grocery stores all downtown and could you imagine in those days we had a Safeway and had a purity store in downtown Dixon, along with three other home-owned stores. And uh, but Safeway pulled out in the uh, 
late thirties, along with purity. Purity was a chain store too. But uh, five to five grocery stores in Dixon, with a population of uh, of eight hundred to a thousand. Well, that tells you how marketing was with it. Today, you hop in your automobile and you drive eight or ten or twenty miles in in just a few minutes or an hour. In those days, uh, driving to Sacramento was uh, an hour's drive. So uh, the local merchants catered to the local uh, people. Well, it sounds like roads, uh, transportation in general, is extremely important to Dixon. Of course, Dixon moved from Silveryville because of the railroad. That's right. Now, you said Highway 40 moved over to Adams, and of course now it's way out of town, uh, Highway right. 80, of That's course. Right. Well, after the war, uh, freeways were being built. You see, back in the 20s, if you, wanted to, if you wanted to go to Sacramento from Dixon, you drove north to a, three miles to what they call Curry Corner. You made a sharp right-hand turn, and you went another mile and a half to Freeze Corner which you made another sharp left turn and you went north about four miles to what is uh, Russell Boulevard or what we call Cactus Corner and you made a right and went down Russell Boulevard into the town of Davis. You went through the town of Davis, you went through that underpass which is still a bottleneck in Davis mm -hmm. and you came out and you followed the railroad clear out to the causeway and then into into, Sacram into West Sacramento, and then into Sacramento. So that was, in those days, that was an hour's ride. Hmm. Well, when freeways were being established, that's when they cut across country. And uh, in Dixon, they eliminated the coming into town through Porter Road and, and uh, Adam Street by building the, the freeway from, uh, from a corner out of Midway, Cross country, bypassing Dixon by a, by about a mile, and then going straight across, bypassing the town of Davis, and uh, going on into uh, Sacramento. And, they, and then also they uh, widened the causeway. They, and when the causeway was was just two lanes for many years into the 20s, and they made it four lanes, and then they finally made it. They divided it. Mm -hmm. So uh, modern gas taxes with all the with all the cars on the road uh, brought about uh, those freeways hmm. so it also changed uh, the marketing deal people in Dixon uh, did not depend on one dry goods store in Dixon uh, uh, we had a, a, a dry goods store it was well stocked and, and was a very well managed but they gave up in uh, in the mid 50s when they closed it down because uh, transporting to the bigger marketing areas like Sacramento and uh, it was uh, the, the thing that killed the local marketing. Mm. Well, um, let's change subjects for a little bit and talk about uh, the schools here in Dixon. Of course, you went to school, grammar school and high school in Dixon. That's right. Uh -huh. Well, what, what grammar uh, school did you go to? Well, we had one one grammar school over on C Street that accommodated uh, kindergarten through eighth grade. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we had the high school. Uh, the original high school, the one that I went to. Uh, well, excuse me, just a second here, bud. Let me turn this over. Okay, we're going again. The uh, the high school, uh, which was we call it the Pillar High School because it had big concrete pillars in the front of it. The good old one that they the, tore the, down. The old one. It was uh, condemned in uh, 1936 because it did not meet earthquake requirements. So it was condemned, and I was the last class that graduated in that, in that school. Uh, when they went to destroy it or brick tear it down, 
they found out that it was built so solid they they couldn't they had to get dynamite to break it up because so it, it would have withstood uh, any kind of an earthquake but anyway the the trustees at the time did not want the responsibility of a of a uh, of a school that was not earthquake proof so they built the present school there uh, the old grammar school which was called the mission school because it was built with a mission style they had tile roof it was an attractive looking building but it was torn down and the present uh, Anderson school was built in its place uh, school population in the 20s high school had a, the maximum had about 130 to 150 when I graduated the senior class had uh, 19 students in it but it was one of the smaller ones uh, but it's the high school grew to where they had to expand into they built a new gymnasium in the uh, in the 50s uh, it's on a large acreage they have a, a, a very good uh, farm future farmer program there with uh, farm mechanics and ag, ag uh, uh, subjects the schools uh, have probably uh, quadrupled in size since the 20s now when you were going to school did they have such classes uh, agriculture and no they did not have ag such classes they had uh, uh, mostly solid subjects I know they had uh, Latin Spanish they had French for a while but they gave up the French but then they had uh, 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 solid mass trigonometry they had uh, also uh, typing business courses now uh what about uh, well, recreation and sports? Uh, Dixon seems like he's always had some pretty good sports teams. Yeah, you know, we had uh, in the early days in the twenties we had a very uh, active uh, baseball team. Mm -hmm. The uh, the families here of the Royers, the Van Zants, and some of the Kilkennys were the both the, the back the, the uh, stalwarts of, of the basketball teams and they were played inner city they had uh, Vacaville and Winters uh, with city teams not the schools but uh, oh, semi I didn't realize that yeah semi pros uh -huh. yeah. so Dixon was uh, Dixon had a real good there. baseball team yeah. uh -huh. but then uh, that gave out uh, in the uh, I guess the World War Two was the breakup of uh, that type of activity plus the fact that uh, car transportation improved to where people's people could go to Sacramento for professional ball games watch the solar and, and go go down to the Bay Area yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. you know I talked with uh, well with several other people in this project uh, Margaret Carpenter of course from Father Head Carpenter's yeah. garage there. But she, she just seemed to love dances. And a lot of people mentioned how dances in town were a big fundraiser, a very well, important social event. Well, that's right. Uh, there was, uh, <coughs> uh, it seems that every uh, holiday it was an occasion for a city dance, uh, sponsored by some uh, organization for fundraising. And then, of course, there was the big uh, Christmas dance that uh, on Christmas night the firemen gave a big uh, uh, had a ball and uh, that was a money maker for them for their widows and orphans fund mm -hmm. but uh, mostly uh, the entertainment was I guess the movie house mm -hmm. they went to uh, yeah, I'm talking about in the 20s that they'd have uh, first run moving pictures uh, but there again uh, in the after the World War two transportation uh, uh, made uh, going out of town for entertainment that 
and the, the local movie house uh, gave out in, in the, uh, I'd say, in the mid-70s. Hmm. You know, I've talked to uh, others who uh, lived on ranches and farms outside of town, and they'd always talk about coming into town for the weekend shopping, uh, getting the mail at the post office. Mm -hmm. uh, and, of course, there was a soda fountain to, to visit. Uh, yeah. But a couple of people have said that when they went to high school that there was kind of a division between the, the Dixon kids who grew up in town and then the kids who grew up out on the farm. Or maybe I that was just I in don't their recall heads. that. Uh -huh. Okay, we're back again now. Um, as far as uh, town goes, you mentioned a large number of garages, a uh, good number of grocery stores. Someone told me that they, they had a lot of doctors in town as well. Yes. <laughs> in the town of, uh, let's say, 800 people, we had three family doctors, very, very confident doctors, and they were uh, very well pat patronized. Uh, even to the extent they delivered babies in the early days here in town. Mm -hmm. But there were three quali quality doctors here, family doctors. I wonder and how we why had, that was. And we, we had, had uh, two dentists. Oh. Uh, I, I can remember, I can remember uh, one of the dentists, Dr. Wrigley, had his uh, office in... Uh, which was the post office building in those days, right on the corner of uh, 2nd Street and, and 1st Street, right opposite the 1st Northern Bank. And his office was on the second floor, and, he had, and there was a window in the corner of that building. And his chair was right there where you could look out. As you sat in the chair, you could look out down the street and see the activities, people going into the bank. There was the First Northern on one side and the Bank bank of Dixon and then the Bank of America just to, uh, exactly across the street. Well, I was Dr. Wrigley's patient as a young boy and he had a, a rifle parked right against the window that looked down on the street. And uh, one time I asked him why he had the rifle there he said, that's for if I see somebody robbing that bank, I'll break that window and start uh, shooting. <laughs> he was a local character, but he was a fine dentist. I have dentists today look in my mouth and see some of the work that he did when I was a youngster, and they said it was that he was one of the best technicians they'd ever seen, work that he'd ever seen them do. So he was, he was one of our better characters here in town. Uh, and the doctors, uh, of course, they made house calls. Which don't, oh, yes. Don't oh, yeah. Anymore. yeah. Dr. Stolle, Dr. Parsons, and Dr. Floreth were, for 40 years, they were our family doctors. Hmm. Well, um, now, with all these uh, garages, uh, Oh, you mentioned the Marvin Garage and uh, the Carpenters had a had a garage. Uh, I talked to to uh, Gordon Marvin and I talked to Margaret Carpenter. Uh, now, that's competition. Uh, was it was a friendly competition? Oh yes, uh, uh, that uh, was just like competition today. Uh, the best mousetrap gets the job done. Uh -huh. And uh, I guess Rossi survived. Well, we we did survive. Uh, uh, the fact that we branched into farm equipment, we still maintained a, a uh, group of uh, customers that were happy with our with our Oldsmobiles. Now that farm equipment, you mentioned uh, development of tractors. Uh, I'm wondering about other other types of equipment. I mean, did you did you do equipment that didn't roll down the road? Uh, Oh, yes. Uh, dairy equipment? Uh, no, uh, that's highly specialized. Uh -huh. uh, no, it was mostly uh, tilling equipment and uh, the tractors, the power that uh, handled the harvesting equipment. Uh, we handled uh, 
in recent years, uh, mechanical tomato harvesters, which was the thing that revolutionized the tomato industry when they had mechanical harvesters. Mm. But uh, that's in current history, but we're talking about uh, ancient or modern history. And uh, some of the equipment that uh, was used was uh, plowing. They did a lot of plowing here which they don't do anymore. Very some, There's very little plowing done today. It's all done with, in the irrigated farming, it's done with chisels and discs. But in the early days, when they plowed for grain, they had three and four and five, six bottom plows that were pulled by uh, wheel tractors and then eventually uh, crawler tractors that uh, turned the soil over where they could uh, plow it, harrow it, and plant a grain crop. Hmm. Now this, uh, this of course is a farm town. This is Dixon. It's, it's a farm town, and I guess it uh, kind of dictated the way people live their lives, uh, being surrounded by, by farms and, well, and ranches, the sheep and all. To some extent, uh, the early day farming. And let's talk about the twenties, mm -hmm. which is mostly grain and livestock. There were some dairies here. And uh, the dairy, the dairy farms prospered because uh, we were close to the milk markets. There were milk was shipped either by train or by eventually trucks that hauled it in cans originally, then in bulk tanks. But original, originally, all the milk was shipped in milk cans, which were uh, five and eight gallon cans. Uh, then. They went into the bulk movement of the milk through tanks, but that was in uh, the late 30s when it when it was moved from from uh, milk cans. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, what about uh, sheep? This used to be called Lamb Town. Well, isn't it? sheep was was uh, one of the bigger things in connection with grain farming because it allowed where they summer fallowed some of their grain land that allowed pasturing for sheep. And uh, the big market for sheep was early spring lambs. And, uh, and of course, the wool crop, they came off twice a year. But uh, spring lambs was the backbone of the sheep industry here in Dixon. And uh, when they irrigated uh, some of the heavier soils south of Dixon in what they call trefoil pasture or clover pasture. It, it allowed uh, fattening of spring lambs on that irrigated pasture. And that was a big industry in the late 30s and 40s and early 50s. But that has passed on to today where they don't do that anymore. We don't have the irrigated pasture for some reason or other. It is not uh, we do still have sheep uh, being raised in some of the areas, but not to the extent that it was in the 30s and 40s. Now, what about all these uh, grain crops and uh, hay, alfalfa? They must have been uh, had to been stored somewhere. Had to have been uh, well processed. Uh, the original alfalfa hay was was uh, milled here in the Dixon alfalfa mill. And uh, that hay was, that was before they baled it in the field. And so the hay was loaded onto hay wagons in bulk, this big, you might say, straw piles of hay. And it was brought into town to the mill, which was where the uh, big silos are now. There was a the Wyand alfalfa mill. And they would uh, bring this hay in on these big hay wagons. They were originally brought in on with horses, but then the horses during the 20s were eliminated and they were towed by trucks. And the hay was pulled off of these hay wagons into a big pile of hay, and then that, that pile would be as high as four or five houses all piled up in one big pile. That was a big 
four or five houses. Yes, it was, it was high. It was, the, the hay pile was sometimes 40, 50 feet high, and it went for uh, several hundred feet deep. It was piled up uh, just off of the street, and it was pulled into the mill on conveyors where, where it was ground and into alfalfa meal, which was put into sacks and then uh, shipped all over the country. Uh, when that mill was operating, you could uh, anywhere in town you could hear the drone of the of the mill's machinery grinding this hay, and it was a, a dust problem. When the north wind blew, it blew it into town. Uh, that was before everybody recognized allergies, but it was part of the uh, part of the scene of Dixon. That when the mill was grinding alfalfa, you could hear it and you could also smell it. So uh, noise and pollution is not well, something new. Then. <laughs> uh, apparently, we didn't have any environmental problems in those days. Mm. Well, let's see. You mentioned the 20s. Now, the 20s, of course, was uh, a decade of uh, prohibition. Uh, you were pretty small at that time. But do, do you remember anything? Well, I do remember that uh, there were three what they called... Uh, pool halls or, or cigar stores, and they were, were at one time, they were saloons. But there was one on the corner that was the well-known Dawson's, and then there was one in the middle of the blocks. And, uh, but they, they had the billiard tables, and they were, they were gathering places for men. They had soft drinks. The uh, prohibition was repealed in 33, I believe it was, and those two places immediately started selling liquor liquor across the uh, the what would be the bar. But in the early days of the uh, repeal of prohibition, part of the law was that you had to serve food in these places where you served liquor. And uh, so Dawson's became a restaurant, they served food, and so did the other place. But over the years, that seemed to diminish as far as the need for food. So in, in current times, uh, there are bars set up with no food being served within that bar. But the early days, you had to have uh, food when you served liquor. But uh, there wasn't any big social upheaval when in Dixon when the uh, when the provision was repealed mm. I think there was there was another one that was started out uh, uh, in the, it was the Buckhorn which is now a bar but that was a restaurant when the highway first moved it was just a restaurant right on the corner of Adams and A Street mm -hmm. well now the, the next decade of the 30s of course is uh, the depression. Uh, how, how'd things? Uh, how'd you get by with your family during well, the depression? Well, as I recall, yes, uh, we we maybe instead of going to a movie once a week, we <laughs> went every other week. Uh, I don't remember any drastic uh, changes in our lifestyle in Dixon. Uh, uh, things were tougher. Uh, I know my dad extended a lot of credit in those days. Uh, for his uh, machine work and for the work on farm equipment. But uh, the banks were there to take care of people with credit, and I think uh, most everybody survived. I think that there were some farm foreclosures uh, in the areas. Uh, I don't, I, I remember some specifics, I won't mention them, but there were some farmers that lost their farm, but there wasn't a, a big uh, a mass uh, loss of farms. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, something that always has been going on, well, I shouldn't say always, but for a long, long time has been the May Fair uh, with a parade and then the, the fair out at the fairgrounds. So. Yeah, I can remember the uh, May Day Parade was a big thing back in the 20s. And uh, it, it brought in, we had a, uh, 
a May Queen that was elected from the senior class at the high school and surrounding towns uh, uh, had their maids to the Queen uh, come to the parade. Uh, then there was a, a, a move to the city park and uh, there was entertainment and there was a big picnic people uh, but there was nothing that, like they have today what brought the change about was uh, in uh, 19 I believe it was 36 35 or 36 uh, the state with their horse racing uh, activities uh, authorized different towns or different counties to form a agri an agricultural association. So Dixon, through some connections with the state people, established the 36th District Agricultural Association, which allowed them to get state money from state horse racing funds and allowed them to have horse racing dates. Well, Dixon converted the uh, May Day celebration into a horse race. And, there, and beginning in about 1936, with this forming this association, they were to bring in the parametrial betting machines and on our half-mile racetrack that had been established in the early days when farmers raced their horses, uh, not, not uh, thoroughbred horse racing, but uh, what do they call it, where they have the buggy racing. Oh, uh, it's the it's it's purebred. The two-wheel buggies. Yeah. Uh, I can't think of the name of that. They had a lot of that type of racing in those early days. And so harness we did have racing. a... Harness racing. Harness yeah. racing, yeah. that's what it is. Mm -hmm. And they did have a real established half-mile racetrack for that. And uh, so they uh, brought in parametrial horse ra racing betting, which uh, attracted real crowds in Solana County and all over. And it went over real good. It, it, it established uh, their building this grandstand, which held about 3,000 people in, in uh, on this half-mile track. And... Uh, that went on. They had to stop it during the war years in the in the early 40s because of the war, and they were not able to bring back the, the paramutual betting uh, after the war, and Vallejo was able to get a uh, an association established down there where they were able to have horse bet horse race betting. Uh, so we didn't bring it back, but we we still had the association. We still had state fair, state uh, horse racing funds to maintain the buildings out at the uh, fairgrounds, and uh, so we enjoyed that big grandstand. They uh, were able to move the high school football games when they built a uh, a uh, football field turf in front of the grandstand. And we utilized that. They utilized it for other events like uh, motorcycle racing and and uh, what's the one uh, uh, where they uh, demolish cars? <laughs> oh, demolition derby. The, the destruction derbies. Destruction they, derby. They did that uh, quite often in the huh. in the 50s and the 60s. So uh, the, getting back to your question about the May Fair, the May Fair is established as one of the oldest uh, uh, fairs tying back to the original May Day celebrations. So it's still it's still a prosperous uh, activity and we have the use of the the uh, state fairgrounds we have here now because it does belong to the state and uh, we utilize it for other events in Dixon. Hmm. Now there's another parade that uh, has been discontinued here in Dixon, but it goes on in other places. The Portuguese get together and they have well, the Holy Ghost parade. We had a we had a, a large 
Portuguese uh, family or farmers here in Dixon. And in the, uh, in the 30s up to the World War, we would have uh, what they would call Portuguese festivals. It was a, uh, a holy society of Portuguese families that uh, honored a saint or someone. And uh, they had a celebration with uh, big barbecues. And uh, it was part of the uh, Dixon festivities in the 30s, even in through the war. But it, but it disbanded. I think it gave out when the old timers in, the, in those organizations passed on and the younger generations didn't carry the, uh, the doings of their society. Mm -hmm. yeah, I spoke with, uh, with Vernon Dutra about uh, his yeah. father was, yeah. was the leader of the group. That's right. Yeah. Well, speaking of, well, I guess you call them ethnic groups, uh, there, of course, are the Germans and, uh, and the Portuguese, and there's the, the Irish. Uh, now, yourself, uh, your, well, your, there were your very ancestors few, from Italy. There, there were very few Italian families here in Dixon to where you'd say we were an ethnic uh, part of the community, uh, very few families. Very few. Yeah. Well, I think uh, it's Lena, Lena Yolo, she told me that uh, yeah. they are act the Italians here are really Swiss Italian. The, there's, there are some Swiss Italians here, which they were from Switzerland. Mm -hmm. But uh, I would say that uh, there were very few Italian families per se. So it's the Germans and the Portuguese. That's right. Now, Portuguese. of course, if we're looking at ethnic uh, minorities, we're looking at the Mexican, Mexican, uh, mm -hmm. Hispanic people that are here, and they're a large contingent here now. They were mostly, as it is in most of California, brought in as uh, agricultural workers, and uh, they came in at a needed time when we needed a lot of. Uh, agricultural help, and uh, other gener as they've established in communities, just like Dixon, they've gone on to other types of work, and so they are, although very much needed in in the agricultural field, they are becoming, they've come onto other types of work. Mm -hmm. hmm. Well, speaking of uh, groups, uh, you mentioned. Uh, associations. Uh, Dixon has, uh, well, you mentioned the Women's Improvement Club, and then, uh, of course, I suppose uh, you yourself must have belonged to the Rotary Club. Yes, uh, my father was a charter member of the of the uh, original Rotary Club here in Dixon, mm -hmm. and then, uh, then, uh, let's see, when I came into the business, I joined but uh, I found that we were we were expanding our business into several other counties, particularly our farm activity, farm equipment activity. And I found that I couldn't attend the regular noontime meetings, so I, I was I think I was a Rotarian for about four years, and then I uh, I uh, resigned. Hmm. Oh. Uh I guess another thing that gets people together are the churches. Uh, yes. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Hold on a minute. Let me <coughs> put a new tape in there. Okay, I've got a, a new tape in this machine. Uh, now let's see. What <coughs> we're, we're just talking about churches. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, we have... Uh, Many churches in Dixon. The, we have <coughs> the Catholic Church, the Dixon Community Church. <coughs> me, we have two Methodist churches. We have the original one that was moved in, the church building that was moved in from Silverville. Uh, and then we have uh, many other types of religious organizations here that meet not in a particular building of their own, but they meet in other places, school buildings, the fairgrounds. So I'd say there are many denominations here in Dixon now. Hmm. 
you know, I was just thinking of another group uh, where people get together uh, really to serve the community is, is the Volunteer Fire Department. Uh, well, the Volunteer Fire Department used to be 100% volunteer. Mm -hmm. When they built the uh, new firehouse, I say new then, in 1929, uh, it was all, it was all volunteer, and there were there were no paid uh, firemen. There was one fireman. His name was Bert Mack. He was a bachelor, and uh, he was he lived in the new firehouse upstairs where there was living quarters, and uh, he he was living there for free to be there when a fire alarm sounded he'd open the doors and be there to let the firemen take the trucks and equipment to a fire but we didn't have any paid fire uh, men as I recall until uh, after the war when we we had one maybe two now I think there are seven paid firemen mm -hmm. speaking of paid uh, city employees uh, in the 20s, way back, we had uh, one police chief and one police officer. The police officer, uh, his duty was mostly traffic. And uh, when the highway was moved to Adams Street, it was quite a problem for people driving through town, there were no stop signs, there were no stops on the whole stretch of Adams on out to North Main Street. So uh, the traffic officer would park in an off street with his uh, car, which was not painted or you would know that it was, an, it was a police car. And he would park there and he would as much often as he wanted, he could get many, many speeders through town, mm -hmm. and uh, the word was out that the, that's how he paid his salary was to nab these these out of town people speeding through Dixon, mm -hmm. and there were a lot of them that were caught. Mm -hmm. uh, there was one paid city employee in those days that maintained the streets by sweeping streets with a mechanical sweep street sweeper and he also maintained the sewer farm that was out at the at the Mayfair uh, property where we had a settling ponds and uh, that, that was a sewer farm that was made to take care of 800 or 1,000 people but uh, we had to by property south of Dixon in the mid 50s and build a new sewer farm. Mm -hmm. Well, let's see. We're, we're talking about the fire department. Do you remember any uh, any big fires here in Dixon? I think I heard about a hotel burning down. Uh, well, that was before my time. Was before your time. Right? That was the one on uh, on Main Street, uh, right where the empty lot is now. Mm -hmm. There was a big hotel there, wooden building. I've seen pictures of it, yeah, me too. but I don't recall any uh, major fires that, that uh, had a, any destruction of any kind. I think there were a lot of house fires. Hmm. We had one of the best fire departments uh, in the 20s and 30s, 40s, I can recall. That when I went into business, uh, being involved with uh, fire insurance, and because of the actions of our fire department, we had very good underwriting rates, and the Dixon Fire Department was attributed for those lower rates. Hmm. We had well-placed fire plugs around town. We had uh, pumping equipment that could man those fire hydrants, and uh, so they, we, we did enjoy good fire fire uh, insurance rates. Hmm. Well, well, some other disasters, particularly for uh, 
a farm town like Dixon uh, concerning the weather, uh, droughts and floods? Uh, well, I don't recall. We we had our years of, of of dry spells, but when we had irrigation come in for most of our farmland, that alleviated the need for uh, relying 100% on rain and, and the weather. Of course, the advent of the uh, Monticello Dam and the formation of the irrigation district, the Solano Irrigation District, uh, added value to our farm properties considerably because of dependent water being dependent. Hmm. Hmm. Well, um, of course, dams always make me think of hydroelectric power and electricity. Uh, do you remember the, the earliest, early days of electricity? Uh, uh, I guess being in town, you probably had electricity as a kid. Yes, we did. Uh -huh. uh, that we had the, the PG&E mm -hmm. uh, office in town. Uh, no, I don't think, uh, I, do recall the, I do recall the early telephone system. The, the, the uh, telephone system in Dixon uh, was on a, what they call a central uh, deal. You, uh, you, you rang your, your telephone box and you picked up your receiver, your earphone, and uh, you got the central office with an operator there. And the operator asked you the number. Her server voice was, number please. And you'd give her the number that you wanted. And uh, she'd take her plugs and plug in mm -hmm. to the number you wanted. If you wanted long distance, she would hook you into a long distance line, and then you had to tell the number that you wanted to the long distance operator. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the, lo the, the local phone arrangement with the local operators was a very informal arrangement. You could get on the phone and the local operator would give you some information that you normally wouldn't be able to get any other place. Uh, not personal, but uh, where somebody could be reached. Uh, you mean the operator knew where somebody was? Well, that's right. Person? That's right. Hmm. I, I can recall uh, 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 there was uh, many times when uh, you could ring the operator and she'd give you some information. It was not necessarily classified or personal, but pertinent information. Uh, I. My dad's business in the 20s, he had the 3A towing service, which uh, in those days was uh, anybody out on the highway with a, with a 3A card would, uh, would get a hold of the operator and the operator would call my dad and uh, he'd have to go out in the middle of the night, tow somebody out of a ditch or to relieve a stalled car and I remember the phone operator was the one that handled most of that. Hmm. Well, um, looks like we've talked about a lot of things. Uh, what, what did we forget to talk about, about Dixon, Dixon in the 20s and 30s? Well, I think we've covered just about everything. Uh, we did talk about the uh, alfalfa mill. Mm -hmm. We talked talked about the train stopping four times a day. Mm -hmm. uh, incidentally, at that depot, it was also the headquarters for uh, Amer American Express delivery, which was train delivery of packages. It was called uh, not American Express. It was called Railway Express, mm -hmm. which. Uh, was packages. That was before truck service came to Dixon. So you had packages come by Railway Express. The depot was also center for telegraph services. If you had a telegram or a telegraph, it went to the depot. And they, they handled it through their telegraph. Uh, we talked about the schools. 
schools in those days there was no there was no uh, district school district the grammar school was run by a group of trustees and the high school was run by a group of trustees but they merged in uh, in uh, I guess it was in 49 or 50 and also in those days we had four or five country schools there were one room classrooms that uh, taught children through the eighth grade and, and that's when they came into the high school uh, this country schools were eliminated in the uh, in the early 50s and uh, uh, that's when they bought buses to uh, transport school country school children into the city schools mm -hmm. and so that was buses were brought in in the early 50s yeah, been a lot of changes in Dixon and uh, I'm glad you uh, came in today and sat down and well, talked with me for a while I hope I uh, put a few pages in the histories of Dixon that, that will be uh, remembered yeah well each each oral history is a little different yours uh, you have a lot of good information on garages and uh, auto dealers and farm equipment, which we, we didn't have up until now. Well, okay then, I guess I'll turn this thing off, but I just want to say thanks on behalf of the, of the Dixon Library for taking time to talk to me today. <laughs>